afternoon. My name is uh, Jerome Doshe. I am uh, the tech lead for the Android Gravel plugin. And I'm here today with Boris Farber, a developer relations engineer. And in this talk, we're going to introduce what is new in uh, Android Gravel plugin. It's zero. So the agenda is the new features. We're going to shout out some of the new features we have. Then Boris will come and talk about some of the behavior changes that we introduced, uh, talk about the BN analyzer. And then I will come back to talk about a big change in terms of API support, which is the transform removal. So it is something that if you are using, you must be aware that we are removing. So it's an API change. So uh, let's talk about the new features. And the first feature I want to shout out is the uh, DSL variant API. So I personally have talked about this many times already in previous ADS uh, last year and two years ago. So I'm not going to get into much details today. But I just want to say that now this interface is stable. It is safe to use. We are not going to change it unless we go through a normal deprecation period. And it's, um, it is definitely a huge improvement in terms of usability compared to what we had before. So have a look. It's, it's ready to be used. Next thing is uh, support for text fixtures. So this was something that was really requested by a lot of our users. Um, so if you develop a library and you, you want your users who are using this library to have uh, the ability to mock some of your interfaces to be able to test more easily with your library, it's, uh, it's a neat feature that was developed by Gravel. And we added support on the Java side of things. Um, in at zero, we are still working on the Kotlin side of things uh, because it involves the Kotlin Cradle plugin, so it's a bit more complicated, but it's going along as well. And so now you have the ability to define text fixtures for your libraries, and you have ability to consume them and use them in your test projects. The next thing is incremental Kotlin support. Uh, so as you probably know, um, at the beginning, the incremental uh, Kotlin support was relatively shaky. Each time you would... Um, make, make a, a compilation mistake, it would start from scratch again, and we would completely move away from, uh, from incremental to a full build. So now we've added a lot of support for incremental uh, plugins, uh, for incremental compilations, sorry. And so it really has changed a lot, the, the build speed, if you're doing Kotlin. Uh, as you know, the Kotlin compiler is not nearly as fast as the Java one, so it was one of the feedback we got. So by working uh, with making it more incremental, at least we are closing the gaps in terms of performance. It's still not as performant as, as Java, but it's a better language. So I think we all can bear a little bit of uh, performance in compilation to have access to all these features. Um, and finally, I want to chat about configuration cache. So configuration cache is a, is a feature that we developed with Cradle. Um, and that is really a huge improvement compared to what we used to do before. So before, as you probably know, the configuration cache is this stage in the build of Gradle uh, execution where we basically constructed the task tree. Right? These are all the tasks that needs to be eventually run. And that takes time. It's relatively slow. Um, depending on the size of your project, it can actually become real slow, maybe a couple of seconds, maybe 10, 20 seconds. And this is a cost that you were paying every single time you build. And so this was really uh, annoying, obviously. And so we worked with, with Gradle to introduce this feature where we can actually cache this information. So basically, we can cache the task tree, and can reuse it, and it makes the configuration cache a lot faster. So it's still not like you know disappeared. We still have to, to get it from the cache, but usually it's a local cache, so it goes really, really fast. Um, so it is now something that is not fully stable. Uh, there is a flag that you can use to turn it on. But we are working hard with Gradle to release this feature to stable uh, by the end of this year. And so it would be really, really useful that you try uh, to turn it on. And if you find issues, uh, to please report them, because we, we would like to fix those, obviously. And so um, look at the documentation about the name of the flag. It really is something that will really improve your build speed and your, your iterative cycle. So I really recommend using it. And Boris will now talk about the behavior changes. Thanks, Jerome. So here are the behavior changes. The upgrade assistant will guide you through most of them. However, as Android developers, we need to understand the changes and their impact on our app. Let's start with the first behavior change. The namespace property is now mandatory in the build.gradle. Namespace is a Java or Kotlin package name for generated R classes and build configs 
replacing the previous package attribute in the Android manifest. To understand why we are making this change, let's take a look at the previous behavior. Previously, the package attribute was used both for setting the application ID and our classes, unnecessarily coupling the two mostly unrelated concepts. On top of that, the application ID could also be set in the app file, creating confusion as to the source of truth. By disallowing setting the package name in the manifest file and introducing the manifest property, we are cleanly separating the application ID used for your app identity and the R class's namespace. This ensures that there is no confusion to where the value comes from and that you can freely refactor your app code and resources without affecting your app ID. The namespace property is available from AGP 7.3 and enforced from AGP 8 Alpha 3. The update assistant will help you to migrate from the package attribute in the Android manifest to the namespace entry in the build.gradle. The next behavior change covers the following features that are off by default. Config class generation, AIDL, and the render script compilation. pconfig is a Java file containing static information about your current build, such as package name, flavor name, debug flag, and others. Previously, the build config was always generated. If you develop a multi-module app, you can end up with a lot of big config files that AGP needs to process that affects your build speed. Most modules will likely not require any of the information from the build config class. For modules that do rely on it, such as the app module, you can re-enable it by adding the snippet to the module build.gradle file. If you still want the old behavior for the entire project, you can set this flag in your Gradle properties. However, you shouldn't do it, as it creates a lot of unnecessary files. Another thing worth mentioning is that buildconfig is a Java file, which, assuming you use Kotlin, further affects your build performance. You can use similar methods to re-enable AIDL or render script for modules that require it, or for your entire project. However, please note that render script was deprecated in Android 12. The next change is R classes are not transitive by default. As you know, R classes are the generated classes that map your resource names to IDs in your application code. Until Android Studio Bumblebee with AGP 7.1, AGP generated keys not only for the library R classes, but also for all its dependencies. This generation resulted in bigger executable size and longer build times. In non-transitive behavior, each R class includes only the resources declared in the module itself, thus reducing the size of the R class for that specific module. And of course, Android Studio helps you to refactor your project from transitive to non-transitive R classes. The transitive R classes behavior is controlled by the non-transitive R class flag set in Gradle properties file. This flag was introduced in AGP 4.1 from Android Studio Bumblebee with AGP 7.1. It is set true uh, for the new projects, and from AGP 8, it is true when not specified, and thus becomes the default. And the last behavior change, array is now in full mode by default, enabling even more optimizations. If your keep rules were configured correctly, there is no action needed for this change. However, you might need to double check that your project builds correctly with the new optimizations enabled. As we finish the behavior changes, let's discuss the build analyzer, an Android Studio UI feature. Downloads are often neglected area in the build performance. Let's see how Build Analyzer can help you there with a new tool that helps to visualize the download's information. As you know, Gradle searches plugin and dependency repositories in the order they are declared. Let's trace a simple dependency fetch. Say Android X Compose UI. First, let's look 
at the Maven repo. Not found. Yeah, then let's look at the Maven Central. Also not found. <sighs> Finally found in the Google repo. Here's the problem. Your build might spend time on redundant network calls from the repositories listed first in the repository blocks. The solution is repositories listed first should contain most of the dependencies and plugins. In our Android, we improve the sync time by experimenting with the repo order. If you see a number of failed network attempts this time, this means you should experiment with the repo order and use build analyzer to track the impact. The build analyzer can also help you spot other build problems, such as dynamic versions. Dynamic version is a dependency version that uses plus or multiple uh, wildcards in the dependency declaration. Dynamic version costs Gradle to make network calls to fetch the latest dependency versions between the builds. You obviously should not be using them. If you are using dynamic dependency versions, you will see downloads right after running incremental builds. As, as we finish sharing what's new for app developers, we want to share what's new for plugin developers. So back to Jerome. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not sure that's new because we actually remove it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, basically, the idea here is that we have removed, finally removed the transform uh, API, and um, this is going to have some impact. So the transform API has been deprecated for quite some time, and um, we removed it in 8.0. The reason why it's been removed is that, uh, first of all, it was a not a very easy to use API, and second, it has this tendency to create bottlenecks, so it was both not very performant and hard to use. So we tried to do a new solution which is going to be more performant and easier to use. I'm pretty confident that it's going to be more performant. We'll see if it's actually simpler, but uh, we at least tried. Um, there's not going to be any help with removing the Transform API with the, with the uh, Upgrade Assistant. And the reason is that it was basically, basically code that was basically interacting with the build system. So the build assistant cannot, the Upgrade Assistant cannot really help you with changing your code, which was using one set of API to new code that uses a completely different set of API. In particular, we've replaced the Transform API with two sets of new API. One is called the instrumentation, and the other one is the artifacts API. So we're going to delve into some of the details about why we have two, but basically you can see it as very different needs, very different solution. So let's talk about instrumentation first. Um, instrumentation is basically when you have the requirement of bytecode enhancing, for instance, your class file, right? So your class file just got compiled, and before they get dexed, you would want to go through the bytecodes and maybe add some logging statements, some security things, who knows. Um, and, and, one of the, and that's a very common usage pattern of the old Transform API was to just do that. You could do this today uh, by basically um, using the Artifacts API, for instance, that we've had for quite some time, but that is forcing everybody to go through the stages of loading the class file, doing the bytecode instrumentation, writing the class file. Now, if you think about it, that there can be several of these transformers chained together, it becomes very quickly very inefficient, right? Each of every one of them will do load, transform, write, load, transform, write. So it takes forever. So basically, what we came up with is an API where we take care of the loading and the writing, and then we call back an ASM visitor that can be chained with other visitors with everything that gets registered. So that means that it's only loaded once, then you have the chain of visitors that will transform the bytecodes, and eventually this will be written once. So it should be much more performant and also easier to use because you don't really have to care about incrementality, you don't have to care about loading the classes and where they're from and stuff. You will be called, your visitor will be called with the right class files when it's the right time. How do you do ASM? I'm not going to get into these details. This, this ASM uh, library has been around forever, like at least 20 years. Um, basically, you write a small uh, visitor style uh, interface where you can visit methods, you can visit fields, you can visit 
outer classes, interfaces with the parent and everything. So it's really convenient. Obviously, this is bytecode manipulation. This is not as convenient as source files, but at least it's machine readable. It's very easy. So you write yours and you do whatever you need. Uh, again, plenty of documentation on the web. ASM is a public open source API. Uh, look at it if you're interested. And then you register it uh, using a factory method and then you register your factory using the variant API. So basically you just say on this variant, I want to have this particular uh, factory that will eventually create the visitor. This is the only thing you have to do. And then, like I said, we will take care of all the steps um, related to Gradle, about incrementality and caching and all that kind of stuff. The, so that's one usage of transforming your classes. Sometimes your usage is a bit more complicated. Maybe you don't want to change existing classes, but you just want to add classes, for instance, right? So very different usages. And in this case, you want to go through the Artifacts API, which is the other API I talked about earlier. So this is really a good API if you have some generated classes that maybe uses something else than a language as an input and generate some classes that needs to be added to your um, to your final uh, deliverable, to your final APK. So to do this, it's not convenient to use, obviously, a bytecode transformer because you're not interested in changing code, you're just interested in doing new things, in adding generated classes. So you can do this with the Artifact API. It's, again, relatively easy. What you have to do is to write a task that will basically either produce new things or, in this particular case, modify existing things. So here is a bit more complicated example. This is a case where you want to have access to all of your classes and create a new version of them. You can add stuff, you can remove things, you can basically do whatever you need. The result of this task execution is that a new set of classes will be available throughout the pipeline of the build system and will be used for the dexing part, okay? So, if you want to introduce to, to interject yourself between the compiler and the dexing, this is a way to do this. So the modify class pass, modify classes task here is relatively easy. You have input files either as directories or as jars, and your job as the task action is to take those inputs and create a single output file, which is going to be a jar file, which is here denoted as the output. Okay. I'm not going to get into the details about what you need to do in the task action, but it's relatively easy to understand. And then you need to register this. So here, this is like, again, probably the most sophisticated example of how you need to do this. But basically, you create a task provider where you create your task. And after that, you can use here the Artifacts API. As you can see, the variant.artifact is how you access the Artifacts API. And here, you're saying, look, I want to have access to all the classes for my project scope. And I want to use that task to change all these classes, basically. And you indicate these are the uh, input fields, the out jars and all the directories, and you indicate where the output will be placed. Once you've done that, you've basically introduced or interjected this task inside the build. And whenever the compiler is done, your task will be called. And whenever the dexing will happen, we will use the result of the output for the dexing part. There's nothing else you need to do. The wiring will happen automatically. So what does that mean? Uh, you need to use this new API because we are removing the old one. We've provided a lot of examples in the Gradle Recipes uh, GitHub project that you can go to. There's about 20 to 30 examples, both in Groovy and in, in Kotlin script and in Kotlin uh, using plugins. So really, it's good inspiration if you really need to use these APIs to change manifest to change dex. You can change the, your dexes the same way. You can change also classes, like I just showed. So there's a bunch of different things you can change, and this gives you an example of how to do things. All right, so what do you have to do? Well, if you use the transform API today, you need to change to the new ones, because in 8.0, we are going to remove the old transform API support altogether. There's no choice around this. If you are an app developer, you probably didn't use those APIs directly. But what you may have is you're using a plugin that was using those APIs. For instance, the Hilt Gradle plugin that was delivered two years ago was using the Transform API. So even though you're not using it directly, you were using it indirectly. 
and that needs to be resolved. And to do this is basically most of the time we worked with the most used plugin community and we've tried to tell everybody to, to change their plugin implementation to get rid of this old transform API. So you need to basically update to the latest version, right? So if you start having issues with the transform API, look into either your sources, if you don't use it, look into your plugins, see if there is a newer version that fixed the problem and upgrade. Otherwise, well, you have to go back to the plugin author and say, look, your plugin is incompatible, you need to change it. If you need to learn more, there is those links. Uh, the gradual recipes, again, is very important. I have good examples, and then there's some more uh, documentation about why and why not remove those things, and some of the other changes that Maurice talked about in the release notes. Thank you very much. Thank you.